doing unto others what we want them to do to us, even though we do not feel like it. See, Jesus did not feel like going to the cross physically. He sweat tears. I mean, he sweat, he sweat blood. But Jesus did die on the cross for the welfare of the world. He didn't, he didn't feel like going to the cross, but he chose to go to the cross for us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. This is not a major point I'm trying to make. This is actually the conclusion of the message I didn't finish a couple weeks ago. So hopefully I'm making sense. Um, the motives of the heart of matter are more important than our actions. Again, we can do the right thing the wrong way. And if we do something the wrong way, we can cancel out our harvest. See, Paul says in Corinthians, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or a necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Um, giving, including tithing, should be an act of worship. It should be thanksgiving. It should be acknowledging God as our source. It should be an act of faith. It should be an act of honor, an act of humility, and a seed that we sow by faith. All these things I've been covering, I will continue to cover these different things. But... What I'm trying to describe here is giving needs to come from the heart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not just the action. It needs to be an act of worship. If we're doing it to, to, to show off, if we're doing it to, to uh, impress, try to impress others, that's wrong. But it needs to be out of faith. It's not a, I'll deal with some of these things as we continue to go forward. Hopefully okay, I'm making sense. I'm going to go forward. Mark chapter 12. And now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. And he saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put much, put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a, a quadrants. And so he called his disciples to himself and said to him, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she out of poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. See, Mammon, I talked about this several weeks ago, will not allow you to give like the poor widow. Jesus watched how people gave. The heart matters, not the mount. It's not about the mount. Whether we're talking about Amos and Iris and Survivor and different things, it's not about the mount. It's about the heart. Jesus watched how they gave. God sees our giving, and we need to see giving as God sees it. It was an important note that and Jesus didn't do nothing that he didn't see the Father do. So Jesus was doing what he saw the Father do that particular day, watching how people give. He wasn't worried so much about the mouth, even though he didn't notice that. It was how they give. See, so let each one give as he's purposes in his heart, not emotionally, by necessity, that God loves a cheerful giver. It is good to give from the heart cheerfully, bountifully, generously, not reluctantly, not under pressure, and not out of debt. Second Corinthians 8, 10, 12 says, For if there is a first a will, willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what one what he does not have. Andrew makes a statement in his commentary. I feel like I'm going to scatter gun right here, because I'm just making some very small points. Um, I'm trying to conclude a message from... Uh, a couple weeks ago. But this verse could, Andrew says this verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 12 could also be turned around and say this if there is not a, a, a willing mind, then the gift will not be accepted regardless of the amount. In other words, the emphasis is on the motive, not the amount. God is not into us, in, into debt giving or deficit giving. In other words, and Andrew will teach us we're not going to use a, a credit card to go into debt to give in order to try to impress God mm. or man. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. And we're not doing it out of debt that we owe to God. We're doing it out of worship. We're doing it out of honor. We're doing it out of thanksgiving. We're doing it out of faith in His grace. We're doing it and, and, uh, and, and, and yes, we're putting faith in what He's told us to do in His word, but we're putting faith in what He's told us to do, not trying to impress God. See, can you see an attitude? These other people who were giving much in the treasury were doing it. I almost get a picture that we're doing our show. Pretending. In which the Bible says that's hypocrisy. It's, it's, it's play acting. The widow just gave out her heart. You know, and it's not so much the, 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 
the, the, the poor versus the rich. It's the heart. They were, they were trying to impress God. The widow was just giving out worship and honor. And, uh, and, and in other words, I believe he only asks us to give what we have. God has not asked me to give a million dollars. God has not asked me to go get a loan of $5,000 so I can give. He's asked, I believe that he can take the boy's lunch and multiply it to feed the multitudes. It's not about the mouth, it's about the heart. God, God could use the widow's oil. It wasn't about the oil, that's what she had. It's not about the jawbone of the, 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 the donkey that Samson used, that's what he had. Peter had a boat, he had a net. Whatever we have, God can use. He's not looking, he, he's not even looking into the, the, the means of what we have. He's just looking into the heart. Will we trust him? Is he not our El Shaddai? We're going to get into this. He's our El Shaddai. He's our provider. He can multiply it. God doesn't need our money. He needs a, but he needs a heart that he can use. And a, see, a heart of faith that will trust him. Can a heart of faith that will trust him in the little can be charged over more. A heart that trusts him in the little knows that God can give thanks and he can multiply it and feed the multitudes. He's looking for a heart that gives, not, not a heart that's trying to, to uh, impress God, impress man. This is not an excuse to never give or to give only if we have extra. Our tithes should be the first ones. And we're going to get into that. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Giving increases withholding more than his right piece of property. We got that out of Proverbs 11. We give from within our means and we honor and serve and worship him for what we do have. We should not be foolish trying to impress God. God is not looking at the size of the gift, but the heart of the giver. God, again, God is not after our finances, speaking after our heart. Do not let anyone ever condemn you or manipulate you into giving. There's a difference between being taught the truth and being pressured to give. Here's just some minor points I'm trying to make here. Not, I'm just echoing here something that Lawson does in his own church. I don't want anyone to ever give out a debt that they owe to us or the church. Or to God, but as a seed that they sow by faith. And we're going to get into that. So, those are just some, uh, the power, again, some powerful points, but it wasn't what I wanted to really focus on. I want to switch gears now. Um, I want to really start getting into the value of giving. Hopefully, that makes sense. I, I kind of rushed through it a little bit because it wasn't some of the major stuff I want to get into, but I felt like I still needed to make mention of some of those things. So, we're going to get into Maokai. I don't know how far we're going to get. Today, and a lot of this I will repeat next week. Especially, we'll, we'll start here next week. Okay, making sense? Yes. So, but first of all, I just want to give an overview of Mal Malachi real quick. The Book of Malachi, and I, I talked about it. It's a message on returning back to God. We can read the whole book. I'm not gonna, we're not going to read the whole book in this context. Yeah, it was a book that was written during the time of Nehemiah. If you study the story of Nehemiah, you'll get more of the, the, the backdrop. What was it? And what was happening with Nehemiah? They were returning back to Jerusalem. Okay, they've been in captivity. And why were they in captivity? There was some judgment that took place. Uh, not, you know, and whatnot. But in chapter 1, you see, you'll, you'll read it. It's about returning to me in your faith. Chapter 2 is about returning to me and your families. They talk a lot about. Uh, husbands loving their wives, and talk about children and whatnot. We um, then chapter three talk about returning to me in your finances. In chapter four, God is returning back to us. In this passage, He will also say, He will He'll, he'll restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, and children to the fathers. I'm not going to get into all that, but sometimes, especially on some difficult or controversial scriptures. It's important for me to see the context. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Why is he saying what he's saying? Where is he coming from? Why is he saying something he's saying? Now, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I'm just trying to give, I'm trying to give a little bit of the backdrop of what's going on, the big picture. 
See, in chapter 1, he's saying, return to me in your faith. Trust me. It's all about trust. Come back and serve me. Worship me. And I will come back to you. You know, there's so many people... I don't want to say it like that to so many people. But there's been people in our lives that, for whatever reason, the friendship broke off a lot. And in each of these cases, because the other person got offended. And our hearts have been so, are so willing we, 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 to, to forgive. It's not like we're not willing to forgive if they, they, they don't come back or return. It's not so much come back to church, don't get me wrong, just to reconcile, to, to, to restore. But, it's, you know, I can only go so far back with that if they're not willing to. It's not like God never left us. When he says, I'll come back to you, God never leaves us or forsakes us. But the relationship will never get restored if they don't come back. If they don't restore, they don't have a desire to, to, to fix this. Does it make sense? And that's not so much my message, but he's talking about so much in this, this book. Trust me. Come back to me. Come back to me in your faith. Come back to me in your families. Come back to me in your, in your finances. I mean, you know, families and finances are some of the, the most important things to people. And so he's dealing with some things that are, are we've been talking about this in the whole series, where your where your treasure is, your heart is also. And, uh, and I'm not going to go into all of that right now. But again, the book of Malachi is uh, these things we're talking about already. Many have taught from Malachi a misconstrued message. Some have taught it, especially Malachi three, where the guy to that he's a God of judgment. If you do not tithe, God will curse you. That's not in scripture, that's man talking. They taught this from a legalistic point of view, as a God who, a God who condemns, they taught abuses, they taught negative misrepresentations about God uh, from this, from this uh, passage. Not only here, but a lot of the Old Testament as well. But off the back, I just want to make this clear, in Galatians 3.13 says, Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, had he become a curse for us, for his written curses to everyone who came from the tree. We, through Christ, have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen? So, we know that. So, and I want to stand on this verse. This is my favorite verse. For he who made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. Why are we redeemed from the curse? Because he became our sin. And he was crucified. We are the righteousness of God. Righteousness, everything I teach in this church, I want to teach from this foundation. We are righteous. All scripture is given by God and is profitable to indoctrinate, reprove, and correct, and train us in this righteousness. I start off with that verse every time in this series. And um, so what I'm going to hopefully teach, I'm going to teach from this foundation. That makes sense? That's my foundation. Can if, I, if we ever deviate from this foundation, then we will get in the air. That makes sense? That has to be our plumb line. That has to be our anchor. That has to be where we default back to. Now, now there, there are going to be some truths that we can say amen or me to, but this is our foundation, and I don't ever want to deviate from that. That makes sense? But I want to start off here in verse 6. We're going to read, eventually read six, verses 6 to 11. I won't get very far because we're almost out of time. But I want to, I want to make some points here from verse 6. Where, uh, the first verse of our context that we're going to be reading God says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are consumed, O sons of Jacob. God says, I change not. God doesn't change. He's not a different God in the Old Testament and a different God in the New Testament. He does not change. We need a, I believe we need a fresh revelation of the goodness of God. That is our God. Amen? These passages of Scripture must be understood in the light of His nature, His true nature. The God of the Old Covenant is the same God of the New Covenant. Now, the covenant is different. It's a better covenant. But the same God, same nature. Okay? If you do not have a proper revelation of God, you will misunderstand this message in Malachi. You, you can even misunderstand finances. You can understand understand a lot if you don't have a good revelation of who God is. Okay? Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is an express image of God. 
we must know the true nature of God. We can't deviate from that. Even when, when we read the Old Testament, we can't deviate from the Old Testament, or from the nature of God. Giving, I talked about this before, I'll talk about this again in the future. Giving is a principle of his kingdom. God gave his firstborn son, he gave Jesus. God ties his son to reap us. We'll, get, we'll teach that more in the future. We are born again of the same seed. Giving is the nature of God. God is a giver. Okay? Again, some verses I've talked about before. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 5, 5. How now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. God is a giver. God is his nature. God gave us his life, his nature, his name, his spirit, his kingdom, his armor. We are born of God. God is a giver. He's not greedy. He's not selfish. God is not mad at you because you withhold your tithe. I want that to sink in from people because a lot of people think this context is teaching God mad at us if we hold withhold our tithe. I want I want to debunk that whole misconception. Okay. You guys with me so far? Okay. Well, I am not. Again, well, I am the Lord. I do not change. God does not change. God says I don't change. He hasn't changed. He's never changed. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He changes not. We must, again, I'm going to reiterate some things. I want this to sink in. We must know the true nature of God. If we do not have a proper revelation of God, we will misunderstand this passage or this message. Yet many see God, and many have taught God as a mean God, an angry God, a judgmental God, a, a wrathful God, a hard taskmaster. Many teachers have admit that have revealed a God like this. Okay. God, again, going back in with this, this statement, I keep saying, God is not after our finances, God is after our heart. God, but God believes His Word. God believes His Word. He trusts His Word. And your heart will follow your treasures. We must see the presence of God in giving our treasures to God. Engaging with God by faith is where your heart is, your, tre- your where your heart is, your treasures will follow. Okay? However, our culture and the church culture struggles with the discipline of tithing. Why do they struggle? I think, one, there are a lot of misunderstandings, there have been a lot of abuses, and there are a lot of misteachings in regards to tithing. Tithing is not about losing 10% of my increase, tithing is about sowing a tenth and honorable worship to God, Amen. serving Him with my treasures and a heart that is following after God. Tithing is not about losing 10%. Tithing is about God resting on my 90%. Tithing is not about a losing proposition. Tithing is a winning partnership where God and I are engaging in our faith and the riches of life. There are many misunderstandings and bad teaching in regards to tithing that I could encounter in this, in this series, but I want to give you an overview and some nuggets that I believe are life-changing that have changed my life. We have an entire... But at the same point in time, let me just make this statement. We have an entire generation, especially the younger generation, not at large, but a, 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 a lot of it, an entire generation that has not read the scriptures for themselves. Many really believe when someone speaks, it is really just their opinion. But this is where I get to with the statement. Faith only comes from hearing the word of God. I don't want anyone to base their theology or their doctrine based on what Dave is saying. I don't want you to base on my opinion, Andrew's opinion, Dwayne Sherrod's opinion, or anyone else. We must, faith must come from hearing the Word of God. And we must hear the Word of God on the subject of tithing and giving. That makes sense? If we, don't, if we don't base whatever we're talking about on the Word of God, then we, you know, I can't have faith in a man's opinion. I must have faith in God's Word. Amos 8, 11 says, Behold, the day of the coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Again, going back with Third John, which I love, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That's where I want to go with all this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
is proper for doctrine for recruited profession for instruction and righteousness that the man of God may be truly equipped, a complete and truly equipped for every good work. So, uh, what we doing on time? That was more than our intro. We got like five minutes, but we'll see how we do. We're good? I, I, I feel like I've gotten as deep as I want to get to. I'm right on the threshold of starting to go there. But let me just read this passage. We'll see how far we, we get. Um, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons, sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you, say, you said, in what way shall we return? Or a man robbed God, and you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be not enough room, for, room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your land, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Again, for I am the Lord, I do not change. I kind of already talked about that. We established that. We must, we must, again, keep coming back to that in this context. God does not change. Get, verse 7 he says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances. You have kept me, you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? In other words, why, uh, especially when it comes to some of the, some of the stuff in Old Testament, why do we resist? Why do uh, we resist them so much? And again, I'm, I'm going to come from the perspective of in, in Malachi Old Testament. Why? See, God's rules and his ordinances are not bondage. He says, he's not being mean. He's not trying to make their lives miserable. His ordinances leave, you, leave us with nothing but blessing and prosperity of our life if we will hearken to them. God is not trying to micromanage us. His, there are ordinances that he has created to bless us, not to harm us, not to lord it over us. When you walk with me, you are blessed. When you walk with the devil or the God of man, we've been talking about it, you are cursed. You can only serve one master. Righteousness leads to life. Sin leads to death. And there's several verses that, 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 um, that speak to this. Proverbs 11, 19 says, As righteousness, righteousness leads to life, so he who pursues evil pursues it in his own, uh, in his own death. Proverbs 10, 16 says, The labor of the righteous leads to life. The wages of, of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 12, 28 says, In the way of the righteous is life. And in its pathway there is no death. Righteousness leads to life. I wish I had time to expand on these right now. I'm almost out of time. That's why I'm going real fast. I'll, I'll cover some of this more next week. Where he made him, and again, I'm going to keep coming back to this. He made him who knew no sin for us that we might become the righteous. We're not trying to perform to become righteous. We are righteous. But that righteousness leads to life. Okay? Again, I want to make sure we keep coming back to this foundation of righteousness. So, and that we're being indoctrinated, reproved, corrected, and trained in this righteousness. Romans 8, 8 also says it this way, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, righteousness leads to life, and Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is a law of sin and death that is in the earth. Even though we are reckoned, there is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. How many you know if we still play with sin, there's still a law of sin and death that still work, that can destroy a relationship and can have natural consequences on the earth. But the law of the spirit of life has set us free from that if we will walk in him. That makes sense? We're not condemned, but if, you, if we walk according to the flesh, there's corruption, there's death, I'm paraphrasing. But if we walk according to the spirit, there's life. Righteousness leads to life, and we are not righteous by what we do, we're righteous by what he's done. But we need to walk in that righteousness so we can benefit from that. That makes sense? 
He said, Yet from the days you fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? So that's the question. How do we return? And that, again, th th this whole book is about returning to the Lord. And they're asking the question, How shall we return? How do we get back? How do we return to you? And, one, and in this chapter, he's, he will mention things in other chapters of this book. But in this chapter, he understands that with your treasures, connect with me in your giving. See, our heart will follow our treasures. Again, God's not after our treasures. He's not after our finances. He's after our heart. Well, man robbed God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what ways have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. And I'm basically out of time. I wish uh, I had more time to spend on this. Oh, man. I feel like if I go too far with this, I'm not going to have enough time to get into all this. So I'm going to stop here. Um, but let me just uh, share this in closing. I thought I was going to get to that slide. But let me just share this illustration in closing. I wish I should have got my umbrella out. Let me know if you had, if I had, a, if it was raining and I had an umbrella. And as long as I'm underneath that umbrella, I am protected from the rain. The, the umbrella is that provision of protection. Salvation includes not just wholeness, but deliverance, too. But if I throw away the umbrella, God's not the one getting me wet. I have removed myself from that protection. We're going to see in this, when I get into the curse part, he says, you are cursed. He doesn't say, I will curse you because of, you're not giving. You are cursed. What curse are we talking about? There's a curse of the law that Christ has redeemed us from. But there's a curse of the fall to Adam. Now in Christ, that curse has also been reversed. But how many of you know that the world is still, without Christ, is still operating and still subject to that curse without Christ? Our creation, we're going to get into that, is still suffering because of that curse without Christ. Christ has already provided the provision, the umbrella. But if we are not with Christ, then we are... We can only serve one master, God or mammon. Mammon is part of the curse. God is, 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 is the blessing. So when, if we, but if we throw down the umbrella, God's not cursing us. In a sense, we're cursing ourselves. That makes sense? And so we, we're robbing God from blessing us by throwing down the umbrella. When we, and I'm just going to fast forward some things, if we either have God's economy or the world's economy. The world's economy is cursed from the fall. Christ's economy is blessed. And we're going to see tithing is a kingdom principle under, not under the law, the Levitical priesthood, but tithing is a principle of the kingdom of God of a different priesthood. That endures forever. Abraham didn't give because he had to. He got and gave because he wanted to. No one told him to give. But there was there was a principle that God has taught. We're going to get mentioned again to Cain and Abel. God taught Abel and Cain. We don't have that message, but we'll see that Abel gave of his first fruit. Cain just gave fruit. One was a farmer. One was a one was a, a, a sheep herder. Rancher. So first born for fruit. And, uh, um, but we're going to see that, you know, when we, if we don't cooperate with God, we don't, what, see, God has provided grace, umbrella. But we need to put faith in that grace. Even though the provision is there, if we don't trust it, if we don't appropriate it by using the umbrella, or we put the umbrella down and say, we're going to do it our way. God's not cursing us. We are stepping out of God's economy into the world's economy. That's curse. And by that, we're robbing God. Not of 
by Ty's office, we're robbing him from the, we're going to see him from rebuking the devourer. He said he will rebuke the devourer. The, 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 the ground, the ground, uh, well, uh, uh, the ground, and we see this back in Genesis, through the curse of the fall, man was going to have to toil in different things. We'll see this with Cain and Abel, that God didn't curse Cain, the ground did. The ground was crying out because of Abel's blood. The ground, the earth said, a curse came. Not God. And we're going to see that. God didn't curse him. God actually showed him mercy. And he said, if anyone uh, tries to kill you, I will bend you seven times. And so God showed him mercy. God still had a re- God didn't leave him. God didn't forsake him. He was still having a relationship with Cain. But uh, the, the, the ground and the enemy wants to devour our crops. He wants to devour the fruit of our ground. But when we cooperate with God's kingdom and God's principle, we are underneath that umbrella. We are not subject to the curse. We are receiving his blessing. That making sense? Again, I haven't had time to develop all this. That's where I'm going to start going with some of this. Everything I shared this morning is more kind of a pre and kind of a transition of, of points I'm getting into, but uh, but as if we cooperate with God's word, it's not our performance; it's our faith in His grace. It's coming underneath that umbrella and getting into the stream of His His kingdom, His provision. Am I making sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm not very confusion. Yeah, no, no. So I don't, again, I haven't had a chance to to develop this. We will look at Melchizedek. We will look at in both Genesis uh, Genesis and also Hebrews. We will look at uh, different things. We will look at uh, how Abraham tied, how uh, Isaac tied, Jacob tied, Joseph included, and other people tied. We'll see how God had a free will offering uh, even in the law. That was not a part of the law. If they didn't want to give, they didn't have to. But that's how they built the tabernacle. We will see in David how David and the people gave a free will offering to build the temple. Solomon's temple was not built on the taxes of the land. Was not built from so- Solomon did not raise the money. The people gave it out of their free will offering. Mm-hmm. And see, tithe is not something we have to give. Tithe is under the God's priesthood. It's something we give, get to give. It, Moses received such a tithe, uh, such a an offering. That he had to tell people, stop giving, you're giving too much. The treasury is too full. And so, I mean, can you imagine that? Yeah. When you have to say, stop giving! It's usually the other way around. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, and, and see, see how that's worship? See how that's honor? And, uh, and uh, we'll talk about how God's re- God's presence will not rest on something that's forced. Mm. And so we'll see this. I'm going to get a lot of different points out here. Um, but, uh, um, but, but we got to tackle this Malachi thing, uh, and people get really get hung up on the curse part. And I'm gonna, I want to unravel that. Uh, and so, uh, mm-hmm. it actually, if you read it through the right lens, through the nature of God, you can right. see it's yeah. full of promise. Mm-hmm. God said, "Test me and see if I won't pour out such a blessing you can't contain it." I mean, I, that's one of the yeah. most beautiful blessings out there, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's, so, it's so true. But let me pray us out. I don't feel like you have a rush out, but let me pray us out. Lord, we worship and we thank you. Lord, I wish I had more hours in the day. And Lord, I can bear with you. Very we going to me. And Lord, we just uh, bless this day as we continue to go. And, and Lord, we just thank you for your truth. Lord, uh, there's just so much, Lord, you put in my heart to share with people about how much you want to bless us. And Lord, I just pray that you would reveal to us, Lord, this awesome salvation we have in you. We worship you, we exalt you, we magnify you. 